The first thing I want to talk about is a quote which I really believe in, which says, the future belongs to those who believe in the power of their dreams. And it actually is true in a lot of ways. When we talk about any invention, it started with a dream. And then it came true. So now, can we dream the same when it comes to areas which are being redefined by technology? As I just mentioned, we have the smart TVs, we have the smartphones, and AI, NLP, machine learning, all these technologies are making a huge play in spheres of all our lifestyle areas. Then why not healthcare? Why not something uh, which really makes us live longer? Let's, talk in, let's take an example and talk about oncology for a moment. Cancer. I'm sure a lot of people would have related, some relative, uh, some person they know, they say they have cancer. And still, we do not have an exact cure. There are various cancers which can be uh, treated. There are a uh, few of the therapies which are out there. But still, we do not see that chain where we can say, yes, this is how we can treat this disease. So before moving forward, I'll just talk about how a drug is developed. I don't know if you know, but it takes about 15 years for a drug to come to market. This process is divided into various steps. It starts with pre-discovery where you come up with a compound and you want to take it forward for further research. You come up with an idea, you try to link pathways, you try to understand the biology, and then you take, take it forward. The first step that you do is drug discovery where you start with about 5,000 to 10,000 compounds which you have to test and it takes about 2 to 3 years to take it forward. The second step is the preclinical step which means the compounds you have identified, they are treated, they, they are given to animals and they are tested in animals. Only about 250 compounds uh, go through this stage and it takes another 2 to 3 years. And then comes the clinical stage which is further divided into 3 areas phase 1, phase 2 and phase 3 and this is where the drug is tested in humans. The phase 1 comprises safety studies, you check how the safety, you check the uh, efficacy in this uh, stage 2 and then the third are registration trials. Post that it comes to market with the regulatory approval and reach patients finally. So coming back to the example we had in oncology, there are so many cancers out there, if we take 20 years to design every drug, this is, the, this is something we have been doing in the past. How can we change it? How can we reduce this time to five to six years? How can we test the patients instead? How can we build algorithms on using computational biology which can predict whether a drug will succeed or not? Can we do that? Yes. A lot of work is actually happening in this area and if we can do things like that, the whole drug discovery cycle can be reduced to about five to six years. But it will not happen without the involvement of everyone in the ecosystem and that is where I came up with this concept of the seven P's of healthcare ecosystem. The first P, patients. Of course, we have to come forward and uh, share our data. A lot of diseases are genetic diseases where the information is not there. A lot of diseases are orphan diseases. We, we hear about those challenges, ALS challenge, uh, Alzheimer's disease, but we need to know more about these diseases. Involvement from patient is quintessential. Second is providers. We have the healthcare players. These are the hospitals which share, which treat us, which give our therapy. Third are pharma companies. Again, these are the ones which design new compounds and uh, uh, help in the treatment of the diseases. Fourth is pharmacy chain, help in the dispersal. Fifth are the payers. They are nothing but the insurance agencies. Sixth are policy makers. And this is where we need involvement from each and every one of the policy makers to make sure that AI is implemented in biotech. And the last is the patient advocacy groups. There are various advocacy groups, be it in mental health, which is still a taboo, or in oncology, or in any other area. But there are advocacy groups which need to join hand with patients and bring these solutions out there. Now, coming to the point, why do we think that this is the right time to have AI in the healthcare side of it? So there are, if you see here, there are four pieces which of four pieces of the puzzle which are coming together. The first piece is analytics, then we have technology, we have access to data, and we have digital. When it comes to digital, we all have those Fitbits and uh, our uh, Apple Health apps which we have. We can track all of that data and do a lot of analytics.
analytics using it. We can predict events which can happen in the future. We have large scale analytics where you can, we can digest uh, multi pronged data in various different ways. We have technology where we can use the power of the machine to build predictive tools. So this is something that bringing together all of these four can help solve some of the questions which are out there in healthcare. Leveraging data. If you can see here, this is a tree that I call, wherein you have all the data points, or the majority of the data points, when it comes to healthcare. And they, these data points are the ones which need to be joined together to make sense out of it. The data can be omics. By omics, I mean it can be related to genomics, which is genetic. It can be related to metabolomics. It can be related to proteomics, which is proteins. But how do we join all of that together and involve our lifestyle data and then make sense out of it? Coming to some of the areas which I think may be of a lot of interest for people where AI can be actually implemented in the future. And in some areas, it is already starting to be. One of the areas I want to talk about is drug repositioning or drug repurposing, where it can be used the same drug which is out there and build an alternate hypothesis to the same drug can be used by some modifications in a different disease. You do not need to involve patients right away. The safety of the drug is already proven. We, the, the thing we need to do is we need to associate through biology and science and see that yes, this molecule can have an impact in this particular disease. Similarly, polypharmacology uh, poly is an area where one target can have multiple properties. So why not focus on such targets where it can have an impact on a broader set of diseases? Another thing I want to talk about was on the packaging side of it. There is a lot of scope in innovation on the packaging side. I'll give an example. Can we focus on packaging for chronic diseases? Chronic diseases are the diseases which go on for long term. It can be diabetes, it can be anything else. And can we design that packaging to make sure that the people are actually taking the medicine? And the doctor will get an idea that yes, this patient is taking a medicine or not taking a medicine. And then we track that with the lifestyle of the person so we can predict in the future that which patient is more likely to comply with the medication that is given to him. Can we build that analytics using data tools? Similarly, we have new technologies coming in. We have gene editing, we have CRISPR. Imagine the, the, the power when you can treat some diseases by slicing genes and healing people out there. This can be possible with the CRISPR-Cas9, which, which really helps in, uh, which can really help in treating a lot of uh, genetic diseases out there. Similarly, we have biomarker identification and personalized medicine. By that I mean is, can we restrict our patient set by virtue of their gene pool? and say, this patient will have a better chance of success because of these genes and he should be given this drug in very simple terms. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. Again, giving, giving an example of oncology, there are drugs out there which have got rejected few years back. Can we collate all that data from the last 20 years, 30 years, the paper data, and come up with concepts using NLP, using AI, and say that yes, this drug failed because of this reason. An example is if a drug failed because of chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is something where the immune system goes down. But recently, we have seen the advancements in immuno-oncology, wherein the immunity itself helps tackle oncology. And why does oncology even happen? I mean, the, the thing that happens here is that there are two things which go out of place in simple terms. The first thing that happens is that the growth of the cells just is exponential. You cannot restrict the growth because there is a mutation in the genes because of which the, the cell growth just becomes exponential. And the second thing is, again because of the mutation, you are not able to see. Your immune cells are not able to see that something is going wrong. Is it? it it's more like that the cancer cells wear a cloak like Harry Potter. So you're not able, your cells are not able to see. What if we use immuno-oncology where you use a target which can help the immune cells see that cancer cell and then device therapy? And that is what is happening. 
and that can be coupled it with multiple drugs so the cancer is actually gone. That is where we have to focus. There are almost 10,000 odd diseases out there and only about 800 to 1,000 will have a cure. There are so many diseases out there which do not have a cure yet. Coming to the harder part about the nomenclature between a data scientist and a biologist. They talk different languages, they have their own vocabulary, and there can be a lot of challenges. If I say a biologist can come up with an idea and do all the AI experiments, no, it cannot happen. Similarly, a data scientist cannot understand biology and come up with the solutions. It has to be a hand-in-hand -hand approach. A data can mean uh, experiments for a biologist, the same data can be a data that is uh, that is gathered from online sites for a data scientist. A, B, C, D is a gene. It's an alphabet for a data scientist. So we have to understand each other's nomenclature. The, one of the first steps that I usually suggest people is question and hypothesis generation has to be done by the scientist. That this is what we want to test and then the data analyst suggests this is what it requires. This, this is the data I need to build a predictive model. Can we do that hand in hand? So these are the responsibilities that I've highlighted. The scientists come up with the pathways, the disease correlations. He comes up with the biological insights and the experimentation. And the data scientists come up with the data gathering, the data analytics, data insights, and again building the predictive models. So coming to the last part of the presentation, I want to say, this is a quote that I wrote recently, which says, the world is awaiting its future leaders. It's up to you to realize the challenge. There are so many diseases out there which need treatment. There are so many uh, patients out there which need that therapy. We don't know that because we haven't got that disease. Mental health is a taboo. Oncology is there. Metabolic diseases, lifestyle diseases, food-related diseases. We have to do something about it. It's not just something that a doctor would do. It's not just something that a scientist's responsibility. If we take responsibilities in designing mobile apps, why can't we think the same when it comes to healthcare? Why can't we think the same when it comes to biotech? We have to make that effort. It has to come with the first step. I believe in the hypothesis which says, it's just initiate and repeat. You have to take the first step and then repeat. It's as simple as that. Take that step again and again and you will see success is right there around the corner. So with that, I'll end my presentation. Good luck to you all. Thank you.